All right, friends, welcome back to the Strong Life Podcast. We've got a special guest, strength and sports performance coach, Dan Fichter, up in upstate New York, Rochester, where there's like two months of summer and 10 months of winter. <laughs> um, That's exactly right. Yeah, super excited to have you on this episode where we talk about sports performance. And uh, we have a lot of similarities. We're about the same age. We're both in the physical education uh, world, teaching, coaching. We run our own gyms and we coach at high schools. I saw on YouTube, like uh, maybe <clears throat> last year, you got hired as the strength coach at your old high school. Correct. So <laughs> we got a lot going on. I don't even know how I do it, but now I see you doing it. And uh, as we do this, you know, no offense to the young ones. I'm still waiting for the guys half our age to outwork us. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on in the course of a day. A lot going on. Yeah. So I want to back up and give people a little background on you. So um, you're, um, you know, in physical education, but you mentioned that you also started out of your garage. Let's give the listeners like a little bit of a timeline of where the you know, strength and conditioning coaching began. And I'm not even sure you use that phrase anymore. I, yeah. I say strength and sports performance coach. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it, It's taken so many different turns. I don't know what it calls anymore. I mean, some people are movement coaches. Some people are strength coaches. Some people are speed coaches. I, I mean, I just want to help people get from A to B faster and be healthier doing it. Yeah. Um, yep. But it started for me after I got done playing. So I had an opportunity to play in the arena football league for a little bit. And then uh, a guy like my size at uh, 5'8", 5'9", 180 pounds doesn't survive long in an arena football game where you can't run away from big guys. Right, right. Um, so then I, it was always a quest for me with, with trying to get as strong as possible and as fast as possible and uh, all the challenges around that. I started to train with a wrestler um, who I played college football with. Um, and it was the only guy I could kind of get along with in terms of training. Like he, he knew how to work hard. And I kind of gravitated towards that. And we came up with some crazy ideas when we were training in college. And he, um, oddly enough, is um, the, the world record holders um, coach in the pole vault, um, Jen Schur, right? So her husband uh -huh. is the guy I started training with. And uh, he was an all-state wrestler. And we just would have some pretty grueling workouts. And we were cutting edge. We were pulling each other faster than we could run. We were doing all kinds of, we're, we had those strength shoes on our feet. So it was just, there wasn't anything I wouldn't try. This to was see if 80s, I could. late this 80s, was, early 90s. This was early 90s. Yeah. So <clears throat> late eighties, I was in high school and had no idea about lifting weights. And I really right. didn't start lifting weights till I was in college. Matter of fact, I remember my first bench press test in college. They put two and a quarter on the bar and it, the guy goes one, two, three, and it fell on my chest. Right. I couldn't even move that weight. So by the time I left for the first semester, I was doing it eight times. Right. So then by the time I would go try out in the pros, I was doing it over 20 times. So it's kind of I've been through it all. I've had an opportunity to learn from a lot of great people because I'm so damn old um, and chase different rabbit holes and, you know, get down to the bottom of a couple of them and going, well, this is dumb. This doesn't make any sense. And then crawl back out of that hole into another one. And uh it's just never stopped in terms of the learning and the research and, you know, it, it's well, just, yeah. Met a lot of great people. Right. What's interesting though, is you, <clears throat> I think the best way to learn, uh, the hardest way to learn is through the application, the doing it yourself. And so um, you're, you know, you're in college in the early nineties. What was the name of the college? Cause I know you're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> you're Rockport big, state. Brockport State. And so yeah, was that a D2 or a D1? Uh, it's a D3. So I went to Mansfield University that was in the PSAC first right. on a football scholarship, got there and hated it. I absolutely hated it. And I said, you know what? I want to transfer back home. I want to be a PE teacher and yeah. I don't even want to play football. Oh, so wow. I transferred back home and the football coach at Mansfield called and changed the scholarship. He was, come on, you got to come back. I'm like, I, I just don't love it anymore. Right, and right. Uh, to the credit of the, the football coach at the time, Ed Matikovic at Brockport, he called me. He's like, are you on our campus? I'm like, yeah, I transferred in. He goes, you got to play football. We recruited you out of high school. I'm like, eh. He goes, just play. Okay. So I went out and I loved it. Why at did that you level, not want, I loved it. 
Why did you not want to play? What happened? I don't know. I, I um, I'm a, I'm a homeboy. Like I'm like right now I teach and coach in the, where I grew up. Yeah. Right. I'm just a homeboy. I'm a Italian homeboy. I didn't like being away from school or from home. Right. And, but then once I got around home, so Brockport's about 45 minutes from my house where I grew up, I felt, Oh, I'm at home. And then it was, then it was over and then I set all the school records and it was great. And then I started to love to play again, but I always loved to play in front of my family and going away. There was no shot of me playing in front of my family. Yeah. So, cause I, I asked because now, um, you know, I didn't really research the percent of athletes that will compete in college, but it's something like six or 7% of high school athletes will compete in college. And then through my experience at the college level, 50% of them quit by their yeah. sophomore year. So you're yeah. down to a 3% who will stick it out. And I, I don't know if it's just division one, but we've had kids that were, you know, that I've trained that were tremendous. And then whether it's been division three or division one, it's like they stopped. They didn't love it that those were the words yeah. they gave. And I wasn't sure um, <clears throat> if it's because they were away from family. And, and that being said, whenever I was at the college level, I always wanted to make the freshmen feel like they were home because I knew yeah. the emotional stress was a lot. And so I wasn't as hard on them as I would be, you know, the uh, kids who are sophomores, juniors, seniors, because I knew if I added there, they felt like they were always kind of like one step away from stepping off a team. Yep. It, and, and that's what happened to me. I did not feel comfortable there. I was, it wasn't a family or I didn't feel part of that family. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's something about Brockport, whether it was closer to home or whether it was the ability to get home on the weekends to see my family, it, it was home for me. And, um, you know, and then football became really easy for me because I love to train. I love yeah. to do all those things. And it just clicked because when the training met the playing, then it, we were on. It was and, time. And the training. So were you training with the uh, wrestler? In <laughs> That's where I first met him. And so yep. your football team didn't have team training or they we did, did, we did, but it was very, I mean, back then it was so archaic that nobody, what, there was no strength coach in there. What it was it? What yeah. we, were, we were, we were basic power lifting stuff. Um, and it was weird because as I started to research, like I had to be a certain level of strength to run a certain speed. And yeah. the minute my strength dropped, I couldn't run the speed I wanted to run. So I kind of figured that out on my own, but then there was a point where, you know, you're stepping back with 550 pounds on the squat, right? And how healthy is that for you in order to play football the following year? It wasn't really that healthy, but I knew I had to be able to do a certain workout from a squat standpoint to run a certain speed. And it's funny because as we fast forward into all the research on speed and everything nowadays, you get people in these camps that I'm not squatting. I'm not doing this. This is what I do. And, you know, I get it. I get what they're saying because you don't need to be really strong to run fast, but that's not how it worked for me. What do you mean? Like you don't need to be really strong in the squat or really strong in general? Well, <clears throat> force, the speed is force per average body weight, right? So you do have to have a certain amount. Like for me, I believe that isometric strength is critical to locomotion, critical. So however you gain that from whatever exercises you do, um, I think part of running fast is being able to understand and control stability at certain joint angles. So isometric strength to be able to run faster. When did you start implementing isometrics, whether it's in your own training or yeah. um, for athletes? Because, um, you know, before we recorded, we were saying like you were talking about how everything's cyclical, you know, yeah. well, York barbell was incorporating they had the york isometric racks so yes. they were pushing isometrics um they didn't mention i think like the uh, york barbell weightlifting team was introduced to like d-ball <laughs> yeah. that was all that russian research that came out it was very joint specific isometrics yeah um so was i doing that yeah absolutely um we were doing some some pause stuff some isodynamic stuff um and that's where I felt like from an acceleration standpoint, it really helped me. So if I was either at the bottom of a deadlift or I was at the bottom of a squat, 
holding it for a period of time and then driving out of it, trying yes. to learn how to, just trying to learn how to recruit everything I owned into the direction I wanted to go. Um, you know, and then as you get further down the road and you start to understand some of the research that you're actually going through, you start to understand that, you know, th these joint positions, all joints need feedback. Right. So the more that you can get into these positions isometrically, it's just creating instant feedback for the sensory system. What about like the simple statement of you want to run fast, you have to run fast on the regular. I mean, how much of it is, you know, especially Tony Holler. I, mm -hmm. I love his stuff. I believe you've spoken at the uh, track football consortium, right? Or are you a partner? I haven't, that? I haven't missed one yet since it started. Chris Corpus is my best friend. Yeah. Chris is, I actually met Chris and then I made the mistake of saying, Hey, I, I called you and emailed you. And then I'm like, so did 5,000 yeah. other people. Yeah. <laughs> like, who the heck am I talking to? So, you know, <clears throat> I'm, here's where I'm really intrigued with that utilizing sprinting for every athlete, regardless of you being a track or a field athlete, like you play football, you're on the mm -hmm. court, you play, like I train a lot of wrestlers, I train um, uh, thrower, you know, all kinds of uh, track throwers, volleyball players, but I want to utilize sprinting for improving your verb, improving your ability to go from point A to point B. I just want to develop leg power as natural right. as possible. So but sometimes people get so like into the technique of things, which is where I'm really not the expert, like uh, too much, like uh, what do they call it? Like backside mechanics, like you're yeah. curling. Yeah. I, I'm not a big mechanic guy either. Like okay. I, I mean, I very rarely, like here's the phone calls I used to get in my gym. We used to get kids that come in and they start to train and parents would call me and say, Hey, you know, little Johnny was out running the other day. You're doing great things with him. He's running with his form is way better, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's great. I hang up the phone. I'd say to my manager in my gym, we haven't ran once. Not once. We've held positions. And now he's starting to understand positions. Or when someone tells me, oh, the vertical jump is going up. And, oh, this is great. You guys jumping up on those boxes. We've never jumped up on a box ever. We jump down. I was so I'm watching teach your videos. Yeah. The body, how to absorb force. And once you do that and you can maintain the position when the body hits the ground, that's running fast because you're really falling out of the sky, landing on the ground, and then you're going to the next one. So if you can conserve energy, if you can stabilize the energy, if you can absorb it and then return it, you're going to run faster. So I tell people this, like when you see a group of kids running and half of them are running on their heels and you, all the track coaches come out with their clipboards and they're like, run all the balls of your feet. I go, I, I say this, I, do you really think those kids are trying to piss you off and run on their heels on purpose? No, they can't because they can't absorb the energy created when they fall to the ground. When they fall to the ground, they have to hit with their heel first. It's a safer feeling for the brain and they can distribute those forces better rather than just the ball of their foot. So, hmm. Maybe we should start training, landing on the ball of our foot to simulate some of those forces that are coming through your body in order for me to give that energy off to run fast. It's like it becomes a normal movement yeah. pattern for them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to back up a, a real quick second to the training you did with the wrestler. You know, yep. you were talking about like pulling each other. So you guys were doing yeah. like over speed running with like. Yeah, we were doing we or? were doing over speed running back then. And then we'd also do downhill running. Yeah. Right. So we would set up these like a 40 yard dash course on a very low grade hill. Yes. Because I always told them, all right, so if we want to run four two, or we want to run four three. How the hell am I going to know how fast that is? Because if I've never run it before, how to. So I could run. I was fast. I'd run four five. I could run four five all the time. And it was really fast back then. Yeah. But I'm like, I want to feel what it feels like to be elite. So we'd get on the hill and it wasn't like we were thinking, okay, from a scientific standpoint, this is why we got to do it. We just started doing it. And then I started thinking to myself, I'm controlling running down this hill. I should be able to do this on flat ground. And ultimately I was able to do that. I mean, well, then we pull uh, ourselves at like three, nine forties. What would you use to pull yourselves with? Elastic, you know, those cords that you surgical tubing. Yeah. 
back yeah. then. We used surgical <laughs> tubing. I can't tell you how many times we broke it and it smacked us. And Chris Corfus and I laugh about it all the time because when we first started training, we were doing all kinds of shit like that. I was pulling as a high school track coach at 25 years old. I was pulling kids in, in the athletic director would come on and go, what are you doing to these kids? And, I, uh, and then it came out where it doesn't work. And then six, the lady comes back and it goes, no, 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 it works. You so know, It's so funny that you talk about the wild stuff and track. So my best friend, <clears throat> we were still best friends. Uh, he was a track athlete. He, he grew mm -hmm. up in Brooklyn, but his grandparents lived in our neighborhood. So he was uh, telling me, um, I used to run like road races with him in the summer that were like, we would train okay. together. And, um, you know, before one of the races, uh, we were somewhere in New York, Brooklyn area. He's like, you know, uh, Coach Z would, uh, that was his coach's name. He's like, before um, one of our guys would like, you know, sprint, he would put a rope around him and make the guy run as fast as possible, but he resisted him. He's like, then he'll go and run as fast as 100 ever. And I always kick myself because that was like 1991. And I'm like, man, yeah. things just didn't register because I was reading Flex Magazine. So Flex Magazine canceled out, you know, like what I should what right. I should have been doing. So it's so interesting when people had to learn the way you're learning. Um, and what about like quick question? I don't know if I heard, maybe uh, I forget. Did you um, study under Mel Sif at all? I went, Mel Sif used to have <clears throat> people out to his house. Yes. And he used to have this super training camp. So I didn't know he did that. Mm -hmm. So I flew out to Colorado, called him when I got there. I want to come. And he's like, he, he was a ball buster, right? So he'd be busting balls. On, I'm like, like, I'm in your backyard. I want to come to your house. All right, come on. He let me in. Three o'clock in the morning, I got into his house. We stood up till probably five o'clock in the morning. And then I went to bed on his couch, went down in the basement the next day. And I spent four days there in his basement, lifting, researching. And one of the most profound things that he ever taught me was this. So he goes, he was like, he... <laughs> At the time, he's like, you're all about being strong and explosive and all this stuff. He's like, where does aerobic training fit into your equation? I go, it doesn't. I was really young. Ah, nah, I know everything about that. He's like, okay. He goes, go into this side of the, the basement. And this is my all my books. I want you to take a look at some of the books on the right-hand side. So the first three books I pulled out are, you know, VO2 training and aerobic conditioning. And this, I'm like, what, what is this? I'm not, he goes, you need to, if you want to understand why you don't like something, you right. need to know a little bit about it first before you start arguing. I love that. What, um... And he made me sit on that, on that side of the room. I, I go, I spent four, I'm four days reading about aerobic training, but we would train, you know, explosively, but he'd yeah. make me go read the other stuff. You went deep down the rabbit hole. And I, I, I know I sound like a cranky old coach when I say this. The young coaches, no. they don't do the books, right? They're watching Instagram and YouTube. And guess what? You, I think you can become an expert in anything if you study some great YouTube stuff. I really think you can because people have hour-long videos. You could consume hundreds and thousands of hours. But when you're reading a book, and you're undistracted from your phone, you're reading, and then you start to imagine, what if I implement this? You start to kind of uh, think of what context it would go in. And so you mentioned, um, I think I heard that story when you were on yeah. Joel's uh, Just Fly podcast, yeah. and it inspired me to also start like doing some research of aerobic work. And so, because you get to this point where you're like, Oh no, those linemen shouldn't run a lap around the field. It's too much. They'll never right. do that. But then I'm thinking to myself, you know, even look, Jim Wendler has that uh, video they posted on like training high school athletes. He's like, there's nothing wrong with being in shape. He's like, we shouldn't be trying to do all this fancy training. If a kid can't run a mile. And I think about it. If you're in high school, it's healthy to be able to run a mile. If you're a big guy, all right, run a half mile, but we shouldn't be so scared. I know I've been there like, oh, you know, everything's three to five seconds. Don't run more than, you know, 10 meters. It's kind of like <clears throat> you, what happens if a, in a game you're winded? Well, you need that aerobic capacity. So I bought that old book, Run, Run, Run. You have <laughs> yep. that book? I do not have it, but I've, I've. It's a tough it. one to find. <laughs> 
you can't, you know, when my wife yells at me for a new book showing up every four days, yeah. she's like, you couldn't get this on uh, Kindle. I'm like, no, <laughs> these <laughs> books <laughs> aren't on Kindle. <laughs> so, <laughs> you probably know that. Does your wife yell at you for the books coming in all the time? I think that's why I don't have a wife. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> too much spending money on training and you're it's, married it, to the, to the business. Do you know the guy, who, um, Dave Asper, the guy oh, yeah. from Bulletproof, right? Yes, yes. He talks about all the money he spent on his research. I got to right. tell you, I, and I say this with Corfus all the time. I got to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of money, but I can tell you, I've spent a lot of money on my research. You're and, obsessed. And, I am absolutely obsessed yeah. with it. to the point where it ain't getting any better. As I get older, it might get worse. Like the problem is now is I get cranky if I don't have time to get some stuff learned for the day. I have yeah. to learn because I'm not a real smart guy. So I have to constantly read, study, talk, perform it. And it's a struggle to learn it for me. So I have to do twice as much as everybody else to keep up with these young guys. But the young guys, they really didn't have to go out and get anything. They're just getting it given to them. And, um, you know, when, when people will say to me all the time, well, I'll go and I'll do some consulting with a team. They'll be like, how do you know all this stuff? I'm like, I'm old. I've been around. I've seen a lot of stuff. So I know what's going to work, what's not going to work. I know the process of how to go through it to find out we better go a different direction because it's not going to work with this person, you know? And that, that's just time. That's but think about this. Um, you, how old are you now, Dan? 51. I'm 46. So you've been coaching and training longer than many coaches have been alive. And so actually, you know, experienced this. I was at a dermatologist the other day that my wife worked for who I, I met him when we were just dating. Yep. So I said, uh, Dr. Cerrone, like you've been in practice <clears throat> for uh, longer than many uh, doctors have even been alive. He said, 90% of what I do now is fix other doctors' misdiagnoses. And so he's got what we call the coach's eye. And yeah. uh, so for, for guys like our age, I always tell people, I go, you know, we're going out to dinner. I'm looking around. I'm looking at this person's posture. Then I look at their feet and ankles and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is going to be a struggle. He's not going to run a fast 40. I'm going to have to work on postural muscles. I'm going to, you know, and I'm like, I'm going out to eat. What the F am yeah. I thinking about performance? I, but I had to stop going to the mall because you're sitting there constantly watching people <clears throat> walk around and you're like, oh gosh, it like may, my yeah. son says all the time, like I'll be walking and I'll be with my son and I'll be like that guy, see the internal rotation. He, that's, he, that's a problem. That's going to be that's a, a problem. <laughs> and he's looking at me going, dad, what is that? I'm like, forget it. It's just a disease. I guess. Yes. But, um, yeah, you know, Louis Simmons said normal people give you normal results. And if you want to get, if you just want to get good at something, we need some craziness. You need to get obsessed about it. And I, I've even said it to the kids like now I, I want to hear how, you know, your summer training is going as, you know, football coming up. Yep. We have kids always, you know, freshmen, sophomores who maybe didn't play last year that can't do a push up. And I say to them, do you need to pay a strength coach to get good at push ups? You don't. And, I, and then let's say three weeks later, they still can't do a push up. I bring them aside. I go. You'll do, be able to do push-ups when you're so sick and tired of being weak. It's going to have to, but until you're obsessed, you won't turn that corner. You'll be thinking you need time. That's why somebody can uh, miss a rep and then kind of reset their mind and come back a minute or two minutes later and do five reps with it. You know, and did you probably read that story in Arnold's um, encyclopedia when he said Franco was squatting? He missed it, but there was these like kids that came to the gym to watch him. And yep. Arnold says, Franco, <clears throat> these kids, you're their heroes. You're, you couldn't squat 500 pounds. You normally do this for five reps. So he said, Franco goes outside, paces up and down the street, comes back in and does it for 10 reps. And Arnold yep. said, nothing changed, but his uh, psychology. I, so I, yeah. that, that point right there is, is an incredible gem that I don't think enough people understand. And I'm gonna give you an example of just what you said today. So we had a group of kids running fly tens today. And it's the first time they've ever run them. 
So they don't even, so everybody, oh, you're a speed coach. No, I'm a intensity coach. Mm. I want to teach people <clears throat> what maximal intensity is. Cause a lot of times you'll see a kid going, oh, I'm going full speed. My son says it to me all the time. I'm going full speed. No, you're not. That's not even close to what you have. And then you run a time, you get a, a time where you see it. You run it the next time and it's not even close. And they're like, well, I was running full speed. No, you weren't. Do you think that the clock is a nice, friendly guy on the speed trainer with his finger on the watch? Oh, you got faster. No, everything's got to be perfect. But more importantly, you need to understand the intensity, which is going to get you the result that you want. I don't care if that's the weight room, running fast, playing in a game, running an out route in football where you think you're running maximum speed. You're not even close. But when you start to give people that instant feedback, then they start to become comfortable with what maximal is. And I don't think many kids are comfortable with maximal. So when you, I, I heard you say one time um, something about, like a lot of people will say, ah, you don't need to be that strong to be fat or you don't need to, right. yes, you do. You need to be strong in the correct position and be able to control those positions and be strong. There's not a lot of dudes like that. Controlling it and strength is, <clears throat> you know, Somebody could move weight, but if they look like a wet noodle, I say right. it doesn't count. Or, or like they're doing this to finish it. I'm like, oh, geez. Like we used to have a ton of football kids, high school football kids come into the weight room. And I'm the strongest guy. I did a powerlifting meet and I did that. Okay, let me see you bench two and a quarter. And they do it like this. They come down. And they're, I'm like, well, where, where can you ever make that transferable to anything other than a, a shitty bench press? Correct. I'm not a fan of the uh, what I try to explain to athletes. We don't have any velocity measuring tools. We have zero software in my high school. Yeah. And um, by the way, we didn't even get to a point where you're so you have your own, you know, performance facility, just like yes. I do. You are a strength coach at a high school and a phys ed teacher. So we're going to kind of tackle all that. <laughs> but my high school has no, you know, I, I text you. I said, what's very interesting is what I see in the high schools is very advanced. Like Mark Hoover, he's pretty active on Twitter. Lots of, uh, you know, they're measuring uh, uh, sprint times. They've got bar velocity tools. We have none of that. So what I explained to the kids is I need to see an element of speed in your reps. And we want to avoid grind reps. and I remember what it's like to be in high school, but I, I didn't, wasn't coached. So I believed in forced reps and negatives and all that stuff, forced negatives for them. I don't, I want one rep in the tank or more. I, and I look back now when I was a kid, I would see the strongest guys in the gym. Everything looked clean. The benching 135 and 405 looked the same but I didn't think that was training hard enough because nobody was doing forced reps with them. They right. weren't dying under the bar. Right. So I look at it like it's got to look fast. So let's talk about, here's the topic I want to tackle for this kind of area, Dan, you know, you've been in this longer than I have. So you've seen even more what I call the de evolution of the athlete where I don't recall kids being unable to do push-ups. Even yeah. the kids, the new kids that are coming to my gym sometimes, I'm like, I can't believe how far behind the eight ball they are. Um, you know, even we're phys ed teachers. And so when I have a sophomore who can't do push-ups, I'm thinking to myself, how did he get by the whole year not doing one push-up? Or right. I'm going to sign up for a sport. If I don't know how to do anything, I know to do push-ups and to run. That's like an automatic. What have you seen with this de-evolution and how has it altered your way of training? So I don't really know how you trained people 20 years ago, but when I look at your videos now, I see you guys using the sand, uh, the bags filled with water. Mm -hmm. I see weights being lifted. I've seen like curling and lunge jumping at the same time. I see some old school stuff with I guess we could call it new school. Although I've seen some of that stuff in like the old Russian books that I have. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's very positional based, meaning you have to first understand the positions you're trying to create to know the end product. So if you, Jay Shorter, I always used to tell me you can start right to end, right? 
if you can't start right, how in the hell do you think you're going to end right? Right. So the guy that did the freak of strength uh, video. Yes. I wonder where people can people find it's probably free uh, on YouTube now, right? It, it might be. There's clips of it all over the place. Yeah. Okay. But, I'll but link that. Some up. of that stuff is is advanced level stuff that oh, Adam Marcelletta yeah. was doing, but but Jay was always fundamental on teach position first, and then try to teach them how to absorb force in that position, and then let's worry about creating force. So many people are worried about creating force before they can even control the position they're in when they're creating. <clears throat> And one of the most profound things that I've ever heard him say, and I've said this probably in every lecture I've ever given is, you're never gonna jump 40 inches in the air unless your brain and your body feels comfortable landing from 40 inches in the air. Big time so, correct. Yeah, and, and I mean, it sounds like, like a profound statement, but if you think about it, it's, duh. I mean, what? like if I jump up onto a 40 inch box and I'm pulling my knees up and I'm, flexing my hip and doing all these things. I'm not really displacing myself 40 inches. You're so, like 20 something inches with the high hip flexion. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But that's so, impressive too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we, we spend time dropping from various heights, trying to understand what position I want to be in when I land. Mm -hmm. Can I be stable when I land? And I, I just got done on our, on our website of talking about just altitude drop training. That's a whole training system in itself is dropping things, catching it, whether it be your body, weights, whatever. And it doesn't have to be heavy weights because when you drop a falling load and you stop it, every muscle turns on proportionally. It's not like you can have a compensation pattern and say, okay, I'm going to turn on my trap and not my bicep. When, when a falling load hits, Everything turns on proportion. What are some of the exercises you do with like catching of weight? Okay. So we'll take, let's say it's a, a fairly strong athlete, 25 pound plate. I'm holding it in my hands, sitting on a bench. I yep. would drop it, go down and catch it at the bottom. And as soon as I apply like the a force front raise position or bench exactly. Raise position. It's a front raise. front raise. Yep. Boom. And I catch it at the bottom. Yeah. So what the kids are like, man, it's hard to stop. Right. Because it's, 9.8 meters per second squared times 25 pounds times the, the distance that it's falling, how much your joints displace when you stop it, all dictate the amount of joules at the bottom that actually weighs. So you're taking a 25 pound plate and exponentially it's heavier at the bottom when you stop it. So you're getting a chance to train high load, high velocity in a little bit safer environment and then again, everything turns on proportionately. So I, I tell kids, some of the, the football guys in my gym, I'll take a still picture of them holding the weight at the top. So they'll, they'll take their shirt off and they're holding it up. And then they drop the weight and they catch it at the bottom. And I take a picture right when they catch it. Every muscle in their upper torso is turned on. Nice. And it looks like they're doing one of those bodybuilding poses. Yeah. But when you play sports, in that cylinder, your body hits the ground. And if everything is on proportionately and knows how to turn on, good things happen. When it starts to turn on here, turn on there, turn on here, fire here, fire there, that's when injuries happen. Yeah, from lack of, I've always explained it in this way, like, <clears throat> so interesting, you know, you're saying this because I say to the kids, when we're like picking up heavy sand balls off the floor, or you're doing a lateral lunge and you're getting low, I tell them it's so your body doesn't freak out when you're in this awkward position in competition. Yeah. Um, and so how many, you know, where would you implement in the training session, this kind of like a uh, drop catch and what kind okay. of reps, what would that look so, like? So let's say we're doing uh, a bench press methodic. Well, we're, let's just say we're doing some type of five by five training on the bench press, right? Just take any generic bench press training. What I do is I cycle in different forms of altitude drop within that circuit. So let's say they do their bench at five reps. Then I'm doing five drop and catch reps. Nice. Then I might be doing um, a push-up drop. Something that simulates the exact same thing they're trying to do from a motor performance standpoint. But I'm teaching them, hey, at the bottom of that bench press, when I want to reverse it, it makes a hell of a lot of sense if I'm Boom! And I'm turning everything on at the bottom to reverse that weight. So altitude drive training is a form of motor learning, is 
when do these muscles turn on? When are they supposed to turn on? In what order are they turning on in? And that's gonna help me complete a lift that has nothing to do with playing football. But if you learn how to turn muscles on and turn muscles off, it's good for any sport. Right, because a lot of sport is this like, you're relaxed, then you have to be, uh, you know, you're exploding. Some people <laughs> say they don't right. like the word explode, but yeah, you have to overcome <clears throat> this. I think it's like, I want to talk how you said, like, I also say when people start really diving deep into the science, I'm like, all right, you know, let me just speak plain English here. Cause sometimes the science gets so carried away. Nobody right. actually gets strong right here. You're it to me. It sounds Dan, like you said, Here's what's required in the sport. This person's got to absorb. He's got to be able to hold positions. He's got to overcome position, move to another position. So I'm going to do stuff quick. But when you talk about like altitude dropping, it reminds me of when I was a kid, my elementary school had a, the playground was a tire yard. It was Mm -hmm. tires like, and I just remember jumping off of things. And you jump um, off shit and you land. And you land. But now everybody's afraid to do that. You know, a lot of elementary school uh, playgrounds are like uh, erected. They were like removed. If a kid fell, you could drive by elementary schools and they don't have a playground. So the kids never happened to monkey bars and being able to grasp reflex and all. I love it. These are critical for human development. You have monkey bars at your gym, do you, like a, a ladder. Yeah, we, we we built certain parts of it, but yeah. we we always hang. That is yes. like if you walked into any of my programs in my gym, in, in the school, anywhere, kids are just hanging around. Me They're too. What do you, what's your reason behind it? I'd love to hear why you do it. Well, first of all, for shoulder health, it's fantastic. Yes, that guy um, Kirsch, I think he he wrote a book on okay. hanging from shit. That's number one. Number two is the grasp reflex, right? So your grip strength is a huge component of shit. How long you're going to live? How's that? Mm -hmm. So we're going to just hold on to things. And then from a, from a perturbation or some type of making it athletic, we'll be gripping, let go, gripping, let go. We're going to, we're going to challenge you once you've reached the point where you can hang for 30 seconds. Like we had in the, in the gym today, we had uh, 12, 13 year old girls hanging from shit. We're going to, and then it's, then it's manipulating your own body weight. Like I remember a long time, to, over 20 years ago, was it DeFranco? I was at a, Sw- remember the Swiss conference that, yeah. um, that yes, Ken yes. puts on Dr. Ken. Yeah. I remember I was at that long time ago and he said, how fast you can run is a direct correlation to how many pull-ups you can do. And I'm thinking Martin myself, Rooney probably said that maybe, maybe, maybe Joe did, but Joe I and Martin it was Joe, to... but he probably got it from Rooney. <clears throat> it so was I'm like, definitely ah, that's bullshit. Yeah. But then I started thinking force per average body weight makes sense. Makes sense. I don't think it's as a direct correlation, but I, I can see there where you're is, going. When yeah. I see somebody that can do a lot of pull-ups, clapping push-ups, if I see somebody that could squat deep, no, you know, no, they got good ankle mobility. Yeah. They got that, their hips get low and they can do pull-ups. I'm like, all right, this kid's got, can be fast, but somebody who struggles on any of these body weight movements, we actually got, um, <clears throat> a little over a year ago, new Sornex racks and I connected them with monkey bars. And oh, I'm like, yeah. man, I wish I had, if I had more space, I would, uh, add on, yeah. <clears throat> but I spent, uh, it was around 09. I got away from lifting myself and I went like six months of body weight training. And through the spring, through the fall, I would just go to elementary schools and utilize the playground equipment. So I would do hand walking on the parallel bars, the monkey bars. And so now I still do it in my own training. We go forwards, backwards, side to side. It's, sure. and then of course, as we get older, that stuff gets hard. But now, you know, Dan, going back to that de-evolution of athletes you know you mentioned like the belief um some kids just don't have the confidence to jump up and grab something and imagine the negative carryover that has to sport if you're afraid to jump a few inches to grab something it's not safe for me to put you in football or somebody's trying to rip your head off talk to me about like what are you seeing with the kids showing up at your gym 
and the high school? Because at your gym, you probably have middle school kids too, right? Yeah, I do. I we have. It's funny because I used to train tons of professional athletes. Now it's more younger kids that come in. And what I notice is why do you think that? Is it because um, there's more strength coaches at the high school level, or kids are distracted by just want to do their own thing? I know this. When the young kids come in, they've got so much stuff going on. Um, it, it's incredible to even try to get training fit into their like. Yeah. Some people will say, okay, you've got uh, lacrosse on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you've got basketball on Tuesday, Thursday, you know, and the people who are trying to make a buck in this industry will be like, oh, bring them in anyways. I, I can't do that. I, I watch see. these kids and they're just going through the motions. I'm like, this, this isn't going to help you. It, it right. goes back to the intensity thing. If you don't understand that intensity level, you're going to be really good at doing shitty things. And that's great. Pay somebody else to do that. I don't have time. For that. I am dude. I feel like we're long lost twins. I have <laughs> sent kids home if yeah. they're just destroyed or I'll, you know, we had a kid, his, he didn't show up for two months. I checked the attendance at the end of each month. Yeah. I emailed the mom. She's like, you got to be more flexible. He's on four travel teams. I emailed her back. I said, this is why you came to me because he was struggling. You said he's slow. He's not getting playing time, but you've got him on all these different teams right. for baseball and there's not, an, my son plays baseball. There's not a lot of movement going on, but when you do move, <clears throat> you have to be so fast twitch. Like the outfielders now, my son's 14. I could see how the game is speeding up. Your ability to steal or run the bases, or if you're an outfielder to make a diving play or even infielders, di right. I mean, it's so quick. And it's like, you need this outside training, but these kids, and it's a business. They say that the travel baseball teams now, Dan, are multi-million dollar businesses. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I the guys that. sell them. So they start, they build like 10 to 20 teams, you know, three teams for age seven to eight, three teams for age nine, 10. They have 20 teams. It's three to 500 bucks a month. You know, you got 12, 15 kids on a team. You do the math. It's six figures a month. And then they sell the business, but we're seeing, and I know I just cut you off. I didn't mean to no, do this. Not at all. I know you're seeing these injuries happen. We started seeing the UCL stuff in high school. We're seeing it in middle school. We're seeing how so much non-contact really it comes down to kids are not strong. That's a big umbrella term. So what are you seeing, especially at your high school? Because you, now you're seeing kids at this age of puberty versus at your at the private facility we could mold them we have time high school this kid can't do a push-up and he's going to be a lineman how do you get off the floor how do you get off the ground if you can't do a push-up so i here, here's what i think i think there's two parts to this first part is the computers and the cell phones these two-year-old three-year-old kids are developing fine motor control before they're developing gross motor control. I show a video clip in my presentations and it's pretty profound. It's back to Jurassic Park when that guy was talking about, you guys stood on the shoulders of, of giants yes. in, in science and you kind of were gifted what you want by creating these dinosaurs. Yet you've done nothing to earn it through mother nature. So you're gonna pay for it. Yes. Right. So when you develop what it's supposed to be gross motor control, then fine motor control, you go fine first by these kids can type and text and do all this stuff before they develop any of their gross motor patterns. You're going to pay for that. I don't know how I'm not smart enough to figure out why, but somebody above me is going to make you pay for that. That's number one. Number two is these basketball players and soccer players, their physiology doesn't match their skill level. Right. So their skill is so good. Their ability, I'm going to cross over. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go Euro step. You're not prepared to do that. You haven't even trained to be able to do that. Right. That's where an injury happens. So when your physiology doesn't match your skill level, and that's what happened. I believe that's what happened with most of the female athletes. And we're all saying, what's going on with these ACLs? If you looked at the development of women's basketball, these girls are unbelievable skill level. Yeah. The physiology yeah. is not ready for it. They're too busy to actually get a, and I hate to sound like a dick here, but <clears throat> I think the strength and conditioning industry, Dan, I, I kind of 
I, I try not to get into it on Twitter, but using the words strength and strength training, it scares parents. And so this kind of younger generation of coaches, they do quote unquote speed and agility. So they have kids just running through stuff, not developing, like you said, isometric strength, the, you know, landing strength, the ability to absorb. To stop. So, yeah. yeah. So they're kind of repeating more movement. They're not, you know, Mike Boyle talks about fill the buckets. And so they're overflowing one bucket and then the other bucket has nothing. And then as phys ed teachers, you know, I don't know exactly what's happening at every elementary school and middle school, but when I started teaching elementary phys ed, we had a gymnastics unit. I had all these like tumbling yeah. mats and uh, I know they got rid of that stuff because parents complained or, you know, kids were saying my neck is sore from tumbling. Yeah. That was normal, common activity. Right. And uh, I've even seen in some of your videos, you have kids like doing log rolls. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I mean, <laughs> like I, I always challenge my son. I'm like, do, do a cartwheel. What's a cartwheel? What do you mean? What's a cartwheel? Do a cartwheel. Yeah. I'm 50 years old. I can do a cartwheel. Yeah. I, but they're not teaching these things. So yeah. because nobody wants to get sued. Yes. I and mean, if, <laughs> if a kid does a cartwheel I'm, to right. one side, they can't do it to the other side. Mm. Now you have a immature vestibular system. Now I know you, you talk have, about that a lot. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different fundamental movement qualities that kids lack today that if you jump right into all these crazy things that people are doing you're gonna just hurt kids you're just gonna hurt them because they're not prepared for that you have to prepare them like i laugh i mean my district finally hired me as a strength and conditioning coach it's just geez it's been 20 years i've 30 years i've been doing this right and what does that schedule look like over there for you dan are you just after school are you during phys ed because you're a phys ed teacher yeah they, they they won't let me do that that's what i'm pushing for like i, I remember i had a conversation with with hoover about this mm -hmm. they teach it right in school down which, south they're right. ahead of the curve yeah and, and it's you know ahead of the curve because they're getting there backwards because they think football is more important for those kids. I look at it like this. If a kid can be on an AP track and take advanced <clears throat> classes and he decides, he or she decides they want to be an athlete. Well, you better prepare your body to be an athlete. Yes. And a regular physical education class is not going to do that for you. you got to be able to get yourself in that weight room and start to understand these positions what intensity levels you're working at, a lot, a lot, a lot. And that should be a track that kids can do. In my high school, they opt out of phys ed if they're an athlete. Oh. They don't have to take it. What do they, they get? A sport. Like study they get a free, hall? Yeah, they get a study hall or the juniors and seniors can <clears throat> get a free period where they can leave school and go get something to eat, whatever. Right, right. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't we take that opt out away and make them train as an athlete? What's the, do you have block scheduling? How long is a class? 45 minutes. Yeah. My school has block scheduling and that's what I would like to see because what's interesting is like my first group after school is the in-season teams. Second group is busy because those, that those kids are doing yeah. homework, but then we have a third group where it's like, you're asking them to give up like their firstborn to show up for that. So everybody, so I said, we, you know, when I was interviewed, that was kind of the goal was like, pull kids from phys ed and give them the option to train. But I think it has to be in my school regimented, meaning right. when you give them the option, they opt. No, I don't want to do it. I don't want to sweat. No, it needs to. to be, hey, you got if you want to be an athlete, you have to be prepared. And so, Dan, as a father, a sports performance coach, you know what I tell the kids is my number one job is to protect you. And if you're weak, I cannot protect you. And that, and uh, what's interesting is when I got there, Dan, I assumed kids were going to know more training because of how much information is on their phone. I was right. like, oh, they're probably studying somebody on YouTube and they're learning great stuff. The kids that were doing their own thing, they would bench, you know, like crappy death defying benching for like 40 minutes. Then they would do some curls and leave no legs, no posterior right. to see a squat or pull up was like seeing, you know, a UFO landing. Right. You didn't see it. And I said, Whoa, the problem is not 
lack of information. We have all the information. It's what's the information they're coming across. So are you teaching traditional phys ed during the day? Yeah. What yep. do, do you team teach with the other teachers? Or we do team you... teach, yeah. We team yeah. teach. Um, and then we, we pick our track of, of classes that we're teaching yep. based off the curriculum that we're offering. And each teacher goes a different track. They all teach the same things, but at right. a different time. Um, so, yeah. And I'm pushing for, listen, just throw me into the fitness center. Let me, let me say the same. Through. Yeah. Let me, S let me cycle through with the schools athletes. Schools so are, can... uh, public schools just move too slow. Everything's got to be voted on and passed when I believe the real curriculum is right in front of you. It's the kids. Because the simple equation for, for your hours right now doesn't make any sense. You can't possibly be in there to get to every kid on those varsity sports or JV sport. You just I, can't. And I then don't. Yeah. how are you going to introduce to the middle school? You, you can't because there's not enough time. And then yeah. how about this one? Well, we're going to train from three o'clock to four o'clock after school. Oh, you are? Well, I'm in a soccer league or I'm in that's this right. league or I have practice. I'm well, in a soccer league. Soccer. Yeah. I'm in Come. hockey and soccer, but it's an hour away. Right. And that's where you, that's, that's where you practice. You practice at school. The only time to get that training in is during school. During school. When they're there and they're accounted for every day. That's the best. See, and that's the heartbreaking thing about schools is that is the best option. But it's like, what are, why do we need to wait for all these votes to go through? Which is like, you know, I'll have to introduce you to my buddy, uh, Matt uh, Baudreau. He works with Tim Kennedy. They start these uh, schools and basically the school is like this open source curriculum where the kids are not like stuck in their chairs and they're co-mingling with kids slightly older, slightly younger. They're creating, they have a lot of um, activity time, like they have a playground, they're in and out. Like my son's kind of roaming around down here, but my son is not built for school sitting for six hours. He needs to start a lemonade stand. He goes right. and mows lawns. Then he could play baseball. Then he teach math. He wants to learn the stock market and real estate, not the Pythagorean theory, you know, and that's where public schools, they have it wrong. You know, my buddy, Matt says it right. He's like the public schools teach people to be good employees versus creators, builders of things, you know, to be kind of like a renegade. So What's like some of the struggles you're seeing in kids? Uh, is this your first summer as a strength coach at the school? No, I, I mean, I've been coaching football. So I basically, <clears throat> right. whoever comes up there, I train them, right? So, so now you've been I'm coaching using... football 20 years, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. At this one school? No. Okay. So I went to high school at this school. Then when I went to college, when I got back and I started coaching high school football, I came back to the school as an assistant coach. Okay. Then I left for seven years to go coach in a different high school, a private high school. And then the head coaching job at my high school came open and I came back and took it. So I've been full circle. I, I started at, at the high school then I went away coaching college in a different high school and came back as the head coach. You're a head football coach and the strength coach and a gym owner and right. a parent. <laughs> yeah, Dude, it's crazy. And you're making a, me look track lazy. Coach. Yeah, and I am track. Lazy. And you know what's crazy? I tell my son, I am lazy by nature. Like if I have a five minute opportunity to lay on the couch, yeah. I'm on it. I'm all over it. <laughs> well, you need it. <laughs> Dude, so talk to me about the kids on this football team, like incoming freshmen yep. or even kids maybe. I'm assuming it's hard for a kid to not train with you since you're also the head football coach. Right. Because so we have, I have <clears throat> a fantastic modified coaching staff that I train the modified staff's kids. Mm -hmm. So they've seen my style of training at my gym. So yeah. they took their kids, put them in my gym. They went through the high school. They, there were different sports, but their basketball did really well. And he now coaches for me. He knows everything that we do from positional work. So when my kids get to me as freshman, sophomore, they all know how to get into a lunge position how to get into a squat position, what muscles to activate, what an altitude drop is. They all understand the basics. Now, are they all great at it? No, but I know they've had some history trying to learn how to do it. So it makes my job a lot easier. A lot what easier. about uh, the push-up seems to be such a struggle in today's younger yeah. generation. 
What do you funny. think? I just it? had my before my son went back home to his mom. Yeah. I said, you got to give me 20 perfect ones. Yes. And he's like, Dad, I don't have time. Oh, you have time. Everybody has time to do 20 push ups. 30 seconds. Yep, yeah. Let's go. And he gets, you know, he'll bang out what he can. And I'm like, nope, those last five don't count. You're in a completely wrong position. What's a wrong position. position to you? What do you look at? Kids that do push ups like that. They don't help those out. Yeah. They're not, they're not perfectly yes. in alignment. That's what I want. So, what we'll do is, and we're just doing this today <clears throat> with our group of performance kids in the morning. We start at the bottom. So, they'll be lying on the ground. With their arms in this position, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Every Starting the bottom. Kid, every kid is like this, like this, and I'll walk around and put them into the right position. Right. So this is the ground right here. So they're in this position, resting on yes. the ground. And then I tell them push. They go up one inch off the ground and they hold it there. So now I know they're ending right. Now kids can't hold it one second, two seconds, three seconds, whatever it is. I tell them you're holding it for 20 seconds. When you can't hold it anymore, put your belly on the ground, take a deep breath, and get right back into the same position. 20 second hold is hard. Yeah, and and the reality is, is some kids can hold it for five seconds, ten seconds. Some kids one second, and it might take them, you know, three sets within that time to get 20 seconds. Um, but th- I know the end position is correct. Yeah, I know their hands are in the right spot. The elbows are in the right position. Their torso is being held correctly. Less errors. Are you using, you know, now that uh, this kind of like preseason summer football started, <clears throat> kids are already like, my knee hurts, this, that. I have them do ISO, ISO lunge holds nonstop. All right. All you can't lunge. You can't squat. Do an ISO hold. Can you explain the power, like is the healing power of isometrics? Yeah. yeah so there was a study out, uh, Montage, in, uh, out of Australia that um, when you're taking care of tendinopathy or some type of tendon pain, which is most of what people can't, you know, with their knees when they're growing, Ajga slot, any of that stuff is some type of tendon disruption. So a position isometrically above the point of pain or below the point of pain okay. creates, a, creates like a, an analgesic effect, meaning it, it just feels good, mm-hmm. right? So I'll tell a kid, if you got knee pain, okay, squat down, until you can't feel that pain. Sometimes it's a quarter squat. Sometimes it's all the way past parallel to get it to release a little bit, but somewhere in that full range of motion, you're gonna be able to find no pain. Yeah. You hold that period of time, whatever it is, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and then three or four sets, that pain dissipates dramatically. And that's where you wanna train. And that's where you wanna be until the pain's gone. Yeah. when Joel, uh, what's Joel's last name? Smith. Joel just Smith. Yeah. Yeah. He interviewed Dr. Tommy John, who's the son of, uh, yeah. the Tommy John baseball player. Yeah. And, um, he works with a lot of baseball players. And he said, after they throw a bullpen, do a lot of throwing, he has them do push up ISO holds, all different positions. So my son pitches, he doesn't pitch too much, which has been good, but I'm sure those days are going to start coming. And I always tell him, I go, Ethan, after a game, you get that band, do your band pull aparts and do your push-ups and your holds in your room. And uh, my, my daughter said, he's like, she said, uh, Ethan told me he does 50 push-ups a day. He does it with his, you know, his door is closed. Yes. But I'm like, all right, that's going to keep him healthy. I've watched baseball players <clears throat> in the 12, 13 age uh, breaking it. I watched the kid break his elbow pitching during a rec game. Um, another kid back injury. I'm not even sure if he like fractured a back and I, and I, I look at it, like you said, you're not that smart. I'm just going to use common sense. I never played baseball, but if you play baseball starting at age five and now you're 12, 14, 15 for the past eight, nine, 10 years, you have rotated one direction thousands and thousands of times. And, and then guess where parents take these kids, they go to physical therapy and they do kind of like baby stuff. And so nobody gets strong and stable and I do simple stuff. All right. You're always rotating to your left, do extra med ball throws to your right. Let's make sure we do side planks and suitcase. Like to me, that's common sense. Or if I'm a coach and you just pitched, you're not going to be a catcher throwing again and again, or why do I have one kid who's a catcher squatting hundreds of times a day? I don't, but Dan, to me, this is all common sense. Well, my, my biggest thing is, is 
<laughs> kids will, like before they'll throw, they'll come in and I'm doing my, my band exercises. Okay. Mm -hmm. So w wait, what do you, you're, you're loosening the lug nuts on your car before you drive it. Why would you do that? <laughs> right. So I'm like, let, let's, let, and, and people always say to me, oh, baseball players don't bench press. Why is that? Show me the motion of a bench press. This is what I tell people. This is the motion. Guess what that looks like? The bottom of the throw almost. Right? So if I'm throwing, that's the position. I'm supposed yeah. to trace that smiley face. Well, this is the position in. And, and again, it's got to do what muscles are doing. I'm lengthening the pectorals. Yeah. By I'm not contracting my subscaps. I'm lengthening my pectorals. So when I want people in good posture, I never tell them, pull their shoulders back. I just tell them, lengthen your pectorals, mm. right? So to me, that's human movement. That's the same. I want to teach this motion and I want to teach it to be stable in these positions. Yes. So I, I don't buy the whole, oh, my pitchers don't bench press. Well, what about uh, this? Do it correctly. That's right. And what do you apply this kind of school of thought? Let's say you're like, all right, we don't want to bench press in season, blah, blah, whatever but the kids want to do it and they believe in it. And if they believe in it, the psychology gives them almost a better result, right? Like some people don't believe in the back squat. So if I squat mm -hmm. them, they'll be like, I had a bad game because, you know, right. coach Avanish made me squat, da, da, da. but they're like, I'll do uh, leg, leg press. I don't know, name anything right. else. So do you ever just look at an exercise and say, well, it's not an amazing exercise. It's not crappy because we're doing it properly, but they love it. So I'm doing it. Right. Corpus and I, we used to call it the movie star workout. Like kids <laughs> like certain things. We yes. give them certain things and I'll yeah. try to create it with the, so you can do a bench press, right? but you can do it 50 million different ways. You can do it in an oscillating isometric. You can do it in an altitude drop. You can change the method of how you're doing it, right? I remember I, ha I heard somebody say to me, you can only bench press twice a week. You can only do that. So stupid me, I bench press 60 days in a row. Nothing happened to me. I got stronger. I looked, it was great. I had no pain. I did Cause I was doing all different types of methodologies. I was dropping and catching it. Yeah. I was pushing it fast. I was going heavy. I was doing isometrics. I was doing oscillating. I was doing rapidly firing isometrics. I love so, it. I mean, there's many ways to do no one question. exercise. You know what this reminds me of? It was the first book that I really <clears throat> read that kind of, I, I feel had made me think differently was um, Dr. Yessi's first version, Secret of Soviet Sports and Fitness Training. Now it's Russian uh, yeah. sport training. But what's interesting is that book was written in 1974. And I always say, wow. You know, I was born in 75. So in 1974, the training that the Soviets were doing, even net is still ahead of a lot of what's going on in America. And that book, how many of the younger coaches even know that book? Right. They probably don't even know who Dr. Yessies is. And I've heard you say, look, I'll learn from this guy. I don't have to agree with everything right. he said, but I will learn. And sometimes what he is talking about in the context of what I utilize, it doesn't really apply. Or it only applies during a certain time of year. So it's interesting, you know, that kind of open, you need that open mind if you want to train athletes. You know, what's crazy is I guarantee you some of these really bright um, strength and conditioning guys now look at Dr. Yessa speak now and go, oh, man, no, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That guy has forgot more about training right. than right. most will ever know. And again, I don't follow everything he does. But right. I certainly listen when he talks because you will find a gem somewhere in there. Can I get one big right. takeaway? Yep. Um, you know where you were mentioning like cartwheels and stuff? In the early 2000s, I bought Perform Better, had the Juan Carlos Santana bodyweight videos where he yes. was training all the wrestlers. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. So, dude, I watched it like a gazillion times. And then I would go to wrestling clubs and take them through all that training. And I look at my warm up like prep phase today and I'm like, man, we don't do cartwheels anymore. My first gym after I left the house and the parks, we would go on the grass front lawn of the gym next door and we did cartwheels. Now I'm like, if I say to the kids do a cartwheel, 
somebody's going to kill themselves. And I also say to myself, did I get too smart? Am I too scared? Like, have you gone through this? Like, yeah. because you're a dad, you know, you overthink stuff. Now you got the whole liability thing in your mind. Have you sometimes caught yourself and said, man, I was a little too, um, what's the word? Uh, like you're crap. I don't know why I'm blanking out. Like you're, you're too, uh, you're holding back. You're like a little bit yeah. afraid to implement. Uh, you're too mainstream. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I, um, you know what the biggest compliment I'll get is and, and when a kid will say to me, Hey, I'm uh, 35 years old. I have two kids. I remember those ISO lunges we used to do. And I'm thinking to myself, we just did that today. Hmm. Right. And that kid was training 20 years ago and he was wow. doing it. Right. So, so, but sometimes kids will say, like you just said, well, we were doing cartwheels and how come you guys don't do those anymore? Right. And then I'm like, ah, oh, geez, I, I think I start, try to think of everything on a daily basis when I'm planning people's right, programs. Right. Sometimes I don't because there's so much good stuff that we just take for granted because we're jumping on to the next thing. Cartwheels, fantastic. So for me now, rolling has turned into, instead of it's just basic movement patterns, it's turned into more of a vestibular activation, which is a global extensor activator, which is training my core. Right. So I, I just got there a different way, but I'm still winding back to where I was. That's been the neat process of going through all this stuff is like right now, I'm really into the neurology of, of getting strong and getting fast. How come? What started that? Be, because it's again, it, it's gone full circle. Like I started with extreme isometrics with Jay Schroeder, mm -hmm. and now I'm coming back into these positions isometrically are why and how the joints communicate with the body. And we find out what joints are intolerant of load when the foot hits the ground. And it might not be what we think we see. It might be a completely different joint far away from the foot that we think we see hitting mm -hmm. the ground and being, and everything's coming back full circle to your brain controls everything. And, and from a flexion extension synergy in your body, that's your brainstem. So when I evaluate somebody running, it's really a fast gait pattern. So what's going on in your brain to limit these dysfunctions that you see? And then you start to create programs that address it, which goes back to isometrics, being in the right position, getting certain parts of your brain to turn on so it understands the message being sent to the joint. So these muscles begin to turn on and turn off when they're supposed to. So everything is, is sick. It comes back and it's crazy. Like even like a simple sit to stand pattern is a squat pattern. It's yeah. fundamental. It's fundamental. Now it, it's not as important as a gait pattern, but you can't discount it. It's there. It's fundamental. You're, you're working mobility, strength, balance, getting up in an awkward position that is sport i mean that is life yeah mel Sith I, used to call it yeah. imperfection training i love it yes and so before i and that's in uh super training yeah um now before i read about that this is what i i used to say um and i actually wrote uh right for this uh wrestling magazine and i was referring back to the days of training in my garage and one of the kids was trying to pick up a sandbag and I used to put like clumps of sand in there and like 20 pound segments. And he was down there real low, like awkward. And he looks at me. He's like, man, this thing's a bleep to get up. I go, yeah, we want you to be in that awkward position. So when it happens in sport, your body doesn't shut down during the oh shit factor. Right. Um, and so <clears throat> that to me is my like, strength endurance power endurance imperfect training is some of my favorite stuff like you know carrying two different weights and trying to stabilize um today i had the athletes doing that at the high school you know they were we don't have we actually don't have a weight room now because they're redoing the bubble so today we did like bear crawls uphill we did all kinds of calisthenics and then we did floor presses with rowing and then the third exercise was your choice of body weight then at the end i let them do curls and i see one of our linemen curling a dumbbell on this hand a kettlebell in the other hand and i said that's perfect yeah because i mean yeah absolutely i mean these things like 
uh, my last Twitter post is our guys wrestling. We have our football team out there. They were playing a towel game where they got to pull the towel out from behind somebody, but they got to wrestle to get to it. Or they're crawling and they're crawling on a midline. They got to push each other off the midline on all fours. So these perturbations are what happen in sport. And there's a certain level of strength that goes to this instability that you have to be ready for. And uh, Franz Bosch will call it robust, right? So can you be robust and all that? I mean, there's a lot of fast dudes in track and field, but what happens when someone's trying to take your head off or someone's leaning on you? Can you run? If somebody just bumps you in the wrong position, can you accelerate from all different positions, not just in a three-point stance? I love that. I I love these positions of imperfection yep. because it has to me when they speak about transfer of training that has the ultimate transfer of training as does dave tate i, I heard him say this close to 20 years ago he goes you know what back then people were bashing the bench for us he's like but does it build confidence in the kid because if it does is that not a transfer of training that you know everybody wants to talk about so Let me ask you a question, Dan, because people ask me this question. We've been at this for a while. We have a good quote unquote online following. I see you wearing a bill shirt. I know people have said Texans, Texans, Texans. Houston Texans. I know people have said to you, Dan, how come you're not in the NFL? I had an NFL strength coach ask that to me because you could coach anywhere. Yeah. Why do you think you're not in the pros? Is it a choice? Has it was the opportunity there? What's the what do you think? I think I'll be ready to go in a couple of years. Here's, here's why I haven't gone. <clears throat> I don't want a general manager telling me how they think athletes should train. Yeah. And say, this is how we've done it. This is what we do. I can't do that because that's not how it works. So if you want to hire me as a consultant and I'll come in and tell you, here's some things that you can add to your program mm-hmm. to really counteract the fact that you're killing them. Well, yeah, you know what I mean. I, 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 when I was younger, I used to go out and tell everybody, "You're doing everything wrong. Here's what you need to do." And then, well, what do you mean, everybody? Who are you telling that to? I don't, whoever would listen, whoever <laughs> would listen at the time, which was really nobody. But so funny. Like I remember when I first started training pro athletes. I, I don't know why it was hockey guys that I started with. I know nothing about hockey, but I do know that that the their ability to apply force is similar to an acceleration process, but they're in contact with the, with the ice a lot longer than the ground when you're running maximum velocity, right? So we were getting really good results. So their strength coach calls me of the NFL teams. He's like, well, geez, why don't you come on and you can work in the AHL and under me. And I'm like, I, I, I don't want to do that. Cause then you're going to come in and tell me how to train somebody. And I'm not doing that. I, I've seen too much, not that I know too much. I've seen too much that I know some of these things don't work. And the coaches certainly don't know what to do. They think they do, but they don't. So I don't want to be set in somebody's cylinder that says you have to train it like this. I think in the pros, you have even more. um, Damn it. I'm mad that I can't think of the word. We're just like afraid to actually work the guys hard yet yep. they are about to enter a game that is the most violent, whether it's hockey. Uh, Joe Ken, big house told me, he said <clears throat> when he, you know, coached in the division one level and then transitioned to the NFL, he said the difference in the speed and violence of the game was comparable to <clears throat> pop Warner to division one. Isn't that crazy? He said, people are dying, willing to die for the ball but maybe they're getting so beat up from the game that the training outside can't be that hard unless they get, unless they're of the mindset. For example, Brian Cushing was with the Texans for a while and uh, my buddy Joe worked with him and uh, can't remember who podcasted with him, but uh, Cushing, you know, my buddy Craig Fitzgerald was with them. I think he was saying like Cushing loved to train hard. It made him feel better. Other guys don't feel better when they train hard. My buddy, John Wellborn was in the NFL for 10 years. He was a hard worker. And I have some friends that coach in the NFL and they say, Zach, everything you're dealing with, like lazy guys, people who skip workouts, people who have excuses. He's like, it's here in the NFL. It's everywhere. 
Yeah. You know, Cushing right now, <clears throat> well, two years ago, he was an assistant strength coach right. for the Texans, right? Yeah. So I, I talk a lot with the Texan staff. Nice. So I'm walking my phys ed group outside one day uh -huh. and they call me. <laughs> it, it, Cushing's like, will you take a look at my knee or something? I don't know what yeah. he had going on. So I, I put him on there. His freaking head is gigantic. He's a beast. You know what he's doing now? He's Jiu -jitsu. He fights. Jiu-Jitsu, yeah. right. So <laughs> that's the mentality of the guys that are going to be there. That I mean, the best. that yeah. know how to train. Yes. They, they're not afraid of it. Like I joined the wrestler in college to train. Yeah. They know. They get it. We need more football players wrestling and wrestlers playing football. I wish yeah. I did it. And I didn't understand it until my younger brother's wrestling coach told me about a guy he trained. <clears throat> my uh, younger brother's uh, wrestling coach was either a two or three time state champ, but he said, we had this kid that qualified for the regions mm -hmm. every year, but he said he wasn't mean. So I told him after junior season, you know, you got to play football. You got to get mean. You got to learn to hit and take hits senior year. He qualifies for States. And I always said to myself, I was too nice. And yeah. coach Ethan Reeves said to me long ago, and I learned it long ago, he said, great wrestlers are mean. He's like, you got to be mean if you want to be a great yeah. wrestler. That's why those guys like <clears throat> normal people go, how can that guy transfer into MMA? Well, they don't care, man. Mm -hmm. They don't have that mechanism of scare doesn't exist, of hesitation doesn't exist. They yeah. just are warriors. I, I want as many wrestlers on my football team as I can get. And if you're not a wrestler, That's I want to try to make you one by the practice that I do because their sport makes my sport better. That's so great to hear. Some coaches kind of, they are like they Switzerland. Lip, they're neutral. They lip, yeah, they give it lip service is what they do because they're like, I don't want my guys to lose weight. I don't want, I don't, I want a nasty son of a bitch. Cookie. I don't give a shit how yeah. much he weighs. You'll get more athletic. When you're wrestling, you are lifting weights. You're lifting a human. You're doing the imperfect training. Yeah. My um, high school wrestling coach sends his team in to lift every day that they don't have a match, which to me is a bit much, but I'm kind of like operate with the college setting of like, you may not agree with the sport coach, but sometimes you're going to do stuff to make them happy. I want to pull it back a little bit with the frequency because I yeah. feel like too much frequency reduces the intensity and then then we don't get much. What what do they uh, call you up for consulting? What's a main um, request they have? So how to implement neurology, <clears throat> neurological aspects of training? What's like a what's like a top one or two things you feel should be implemented? Or you should we should be trying to incorporate to implement neurology? Vestibular training, um, working with your eyes. Um, what does that mean? Like so if I'm my ability for my eyes to converge which is ultimately going to change my posture because mm -hmm. your posture is not something that I train in the weight room. It's set by your eyes and or your feet with your vestibular system. So if we are constantly trying to be in the correct position, let's make sure our nervous system knows what the correct position is, meaning my eyes on the horizon, my feet on the ground. So all that tactile communication that we talk about we all talk about foot mechanics and biomechanically what we see, but from a neurological standpoint, flexion and extension synergies are controlled by your brainstem, not your ability to curl a weight or whatever. We spend most of our equation training on the voluntary side, where most of sport is won on the reflexive side. I'm going to give you an example, yeah. right? So for me to move my <clears throat> left hand, it's controlled by my right brain. So this is a voluntary movement controlled and initiated by my right brain. While my right brain is initiating that movement, it's firing a spinal cord message to fire my stabilizers on the ipsilateral side of the brain that's working. So right brain controlling left movement, firing ipsilaterally down my paraspinals so I don't fall over when I reach for something. So that reflexive quality of training, we don't do that much. We spend a lot of time on the equation of the voluntary movement, which is wonderful. Altitude drops, reflexive training, all these things are neurological aspects of training, not just voluntary movements.
it's like uh, Cal Dietz does those like you'll do like a pistol bench squat with a row on the other side, but I've seen people do it like sloppy. Yeah. And that's, then you're, but that's you reflexive it right. from a, from a muscular standpoint. I'm even talking more of if you're start moving this side, this is happening regardless of what you think and believe it's happening. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. So those are the parts of the equation that I want to be on. And most people don't have a lot of familiarity with that. So that's where I come in and I help them. So most of the stuff that I'm doing now is, okay, my guy runs like this. How can I make him run different? My guy bench presses like this. How can I change that? And most people look at it from a biomechanical lens. This yes. muscle is not doing this because of this joint position. Right. I look at it like if my eyes didn't set the horizon correctly, how could I possibly move that weight correctly? If the tactile sensation in my hand is failing on the side I'm going down on the bench press, that's why. It's not because you haven't done enough presses with your right arm. Hmm. And people are like, well, I, I don't understand that concept. I'm like, okay, so this is, the, this is the example I give to everybody and I'll do it to you. If you turn and face this way, right? Mm -hmm. So turn and face this way and show me your shoulder flexion. Which arm? Which arm? Right. I want to see both of them. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. So bring it right up from your side so I can see which one goes back further. Oh, both. Because you're going to, you're going to have. At the same time? Both no, at the same one time? one at a time. So I'm going to okay. go like that. Yep. And I'm going to bring it straight up and do that. Okay. Good. And then bring that other one down. Which one goes further or feels better? Um, got a lot of injuries. So <laughs> I would say the left, the right side is tighter. The left side goes back further, but the left side is the one with more, more injuries. The left side has more injuries. So is there pain when you lift your left arm? No, no, no pain. Any pain on your right side? No, but my lats and pecs are super tight. So, uh, but the left side has had a surgery. I've had like, you know, a torn rotator. I think I exploded my labrum a couple <laughs> years ago. Okay. So if you can give me a discrepancy in range of motion from left to right, or if you can do a torso turn, mm -hmm. and tell me right to left, what discrepancy there is. Why don't you try that? So why don't you turn? Yep. Show me a, a, a torso turn. I'll turn. Yep. Okay. Okay, you go to your left, your right way easier. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, and I can even feel it if I do like a sitting 90-90 hip. One side yep. is like, yeah. Okay, so in normal, <clears throat> normal world, we would say, okay, if you go to the right better, we need to go to the left and train it. We need mm -hmm. to, you know, maybe under train it. Maybe you go to the point where there, it's tight, and then you try to get stronger in that position. If you're training reflexively, you'd go to the good side. And here's what I mean by that. So you rotate to the right and you're like, I got pretty good range of motion. So yeah. what I want you to do is do five repetitions where you go all the way. And then I want you to cheat it. Kind of pick your arm and turn your head and try to get more range of motion and push to the right. All right try so that. Do, do five to my right. So you're right. That's your good side. Yep. Yep. And grab the handle of the chair and move yourself e further. Every rep or only on the last? No, every rep. Okay. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Good. Boom. Turn. Good. Now, as you're doing this, you're buying a little bit more range of motion on your good side. Right. That's common sense. Good. Yep. Okay. And watch this. Go to your left one time. It'll be one better. Time. It'll be better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Way, way better. <laughs> It's like Wait, another that's, two or three inches. <laughs> yeah, that's reflexively. That's, <clears throat> that's what happens. Funny. Because when I begin to move the right arm or the right shoulder, whatever it is, yeah. it's controlled by my left brain. Mm. <laughs> so if you have a that limitation and you right. work on the other, the good side, yeah, you are now firing reflexively of the bad side, which is responsible for pain, fibers, and stability. Yeah. So boom, instantaneous. So you do five reps on your good side instant change of motion i think i saw you do this with jake tour on his i do it with everybody because yeah. people are still like well wait a minute my bad side should i do that side? no forget that side really? the brain will balance you out and people are like there's no way that works well try it what if there's like muscular difference in the right left okay so 
so what do you mean by that so meaning my right arm is like shoulder more it's like bigger than the left mm-hmm. side even if i do extra left arm work it's a- asymmetrical okay a- <clears throat> asymmetrically asymmetrics in the body they're okay there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that for the most part if you're saying that if i just train my right rotation would my left rotation ever get more muscular or whatever because i'm not doing any hypertrophy work i've been trying to get big muscles my entire life it's not that There's, easy you know it's not <laughs> it really is i wish it was but it's not so when i talk to physical therapists about this like oh you're gonna have one side bigger than really okay but that's not neurology neurology is crosstalk and and they'll talk about it a little bit but they don't really understand it so we'll go in the weight room and this is what what i'll explain to kids and we had the younger kids doing it today so i said show me your flexion so they go like this and then my left goes way further so i say to them if we start strength training this right now we have that and we have this this is way further than that and if i strength train that i just got really strong in a compensatory pattern why not do about five reps on the left and my right will get way better. Now I can start training. I've balanced myself structurally. So we'll go from top to bottom, balance ourselves out, and then we'll train. It's like you're just overthinking, trying to, the common theme is work your weak side. Yeah. 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 When I can change it neurologically like that, why wouldn't I? It's like a fire. Yeah. Sometimes I say to myself, like, it, it's like a, a, f- a lack of firing, I guess, lack of, I don't well, know. Your brain, your brain can't get the message to move it. Same thing with like glute bridges, right? And that's where the whole RPR thing turned out. You can do a million glute bridges and test your gluten. It still don't work Be- because your brain still has to figure out where your butt is. And until that connection is made, you can get all kinds of hypertrophy or whatever you want in there, but it's still not going to turn on the way it needs to turn on. And so how would you turn on the glutes? Um, we'll do that in another podcast. Yeah. That'll take a little bit too long, but let's, yeah, you can do this. And this is part of the neurology of training. Let's, I want to like, uh, what was the, tr- I want to give almost like a concrete example. So you yeah. trained today in the weight room with the football team or outside or both? We were with the performance group today. So what we did today is, like I said, when we first got on this podcast, everybody started with hanging from something. Yeah. Okay. And then they did their good sided. I call them their good sided exercises. So every kid, we picked upper torso exercises. So they do shoulder flexion. Yep. They find their good side. They do five or six reps. They go back to their bad side, make sure it's better. Then they do a torso turn. Here, yeah, I'm way worse going to my right. Okay. Right. So I go here and it'll just work right now. I'm, I'm trying to increase on the left. Then I go back to my right. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm way better. <laughs> I'm not trying. It just, it just happens. people have to watch this. So if you're listening, you got to look on the YouTube. Yeah. All right. Okay. And- so then we'll pick a lower body. So everybody loves to do pistol squats. Yeah. So we'll take a, a low plyometric box. Let's say it's a 12 inch box. I'll tell the kid, sit on down with one leg. Let's see if I can. So if, if I'm standing like this, I'll say, sit on down on one leg Yep. Okay, and then try the other one. Which right. one feels better? Oh, my left one's way more better. Okay. Do five reps on your left leg. They do five reps. I go, try on your right leg now. They're like, Ooh, oh, I went right up. Good. Perfect. Done with your lower body. So they will only do. So for example, I had a, a, my fourth knee surgery on my right knee last, not this March, the previous. Yes. So to kind of like get the neurology better to my right knee, I should kick it off with like left side pistol squats. Absolutely. And then what would, so let's say I do five pistol squats to the bench, left leg. Then what do I do with the right leg? Five. Okay. So no, no, no. So let's say this is how I'd start with that. Let's say it was just knee flexion you wanted, Mm -hmm. right? So let's say this was the motion that you're limited. Yes. Right. So you get to here and the other one goes right up. Right. Right. So what I would do is I go on my good side and I go five reps. Then I okay. rest for a little bit. Then I go five reps again on my right. I rest a little bit and I go five more reps. 
And if I'm getting good on my right side, I'd start waiting and I'd put a band on the back of my heel and I'd wait it. Then I go come back to the good, the bad side and I go one rep, boom, better. If it's better, I do another set on the good side. But that's then weird. I go back that, and okay. I check one rep again. If it's better again, I go back and do another set. I go until it doesn't get any better. So I'm doing a movement, not necessarily a strength exercise like a pistol squat. I'm going to do it could be anything. So if someone has a bad shoulder, <clears throat> I, I'm going to tell you, here's what I did last year in a football game. <laughs> and I don't tell a lot of people this stuff because we have a really good trainer and I don't tell her what I do. So I just do it and I don't have to touch anybody. So it's all within my scope. Here's what we do. The kid comes off. Oh my God, my shoulder. I got a stinger. I got a stinger. I got a stinger. Go see the trainer. Comes over and he's standing next to me and he's like, I got a stinger coach. I'm like, okay, what did the trainer say? Well, the trainer said, if I can get my full range of motion back, I can go back in. Oh, okay. Can you move your left arm? He's like, of course, coach. It doesn't hurt. I said, okay. I want you to move your left arm 10 times up in the air like this. So he does this. He does this. He coach my right arm hurts. I'm like, I, I know what hurts. Thanks. 10 more. Okay. Move your right arm one time. Yeah. But coach. I, oh, okay. Go show the trainer that you can move it like that. Okay. Done. Just like that. It's that so powerful. It'd be like a kid who's like my, I pulled my hamstring. So you'd lay them on their back, do the straight leg lift with the good. Leg. I tell you what, I, I had a guy. Now th in this system is a guy by the name of Tom. Delonzo Baker. He created a system called Total Motion Release. You gotta look it up. All right. You, you gotta have a conversation with this guy. He's fascinating, right? I, I was working with a guy. I won't name the school. Power Five School. Strength coach called me and said, "Listen, we got a guy. He's got a hamstring." I said, "Okay." He goes, "We gotta play. We're playing the number one team in the nation. He's gotta play." I'm like, "Okay. Well, what, what happened to him? He he hit this on the GPS and he hurt himself. That's okay. So he's got bad hamstrings. Yep." So before the meetings, he comes in, and this is, this is our test. What hurts? He goes, coach, when I, my dog's in the way, when I reach down to touch my left leg like this, it's killing me. I said, okay, put your right foot out. Stretch like that. Does that hurt? Well, no, coach, my left leg hurts. I said, okay, I want you to stretch this a few times. Okay, coach, but my left hamstring hurts. They're looking at me like I'm crazy. He keeps doing it. I said, all right, now go back to your left leg. How does that feel? He goes, oh, it, it's a little better. I go, how much better? Yeah, about 20%. I said, ah, that's not really what I want, but okay, do it again. So he does it again on the right side. He comes back to the left side. He goes, nah, it's no better than 20%. I said, okay, let's try a torso turn. He goes, coach, I hurt my left hamstring. Try a torso turn. He goes this way. And he goes this way and his right was worse. It's okay, let's go to your left. So he's doing a left rotation to increase right rotation, but I don't care about the right rotation. I'm worried about his hamstring. So we go left rotation. I said, now check your hamstring. And he goes, coach, I hurt my left hamstring. I just did a torso I said, check it. He goes down, he goes, nah, it's no better. So now I'm going, oh shit, he thinks I'm crazy. So I said, check your shoulders. So he goes like this, and he goes, oh, my shoulders, it's tight. Right one's better? He's like, yeah. I go, okay, do the right one. Coach, I hurt my left hamstring. So he does this six times. I go, touch your toes. He goes, holy shit, it's gone. I go, well, okay. can, what, So what is it? It's just all connected, or it's the it's neurology, something's it's, blocked? It's neurology, and we can call right shoulder, left hip. We can make the connections from a biomechanical mind that we want, but I'm working more right brain, left brain, right? So now he goes, how in the hell did that work? I'm like, well, you're not healed yet. Give me another right. Give me another right. Give me another right. Now, how does it feel? Coach, it's even better. I said, okay, here's your exercises. The opposite leg stretch made it 20% better. You're going to do three sets of that. Then you're going to do your right shoulder. He goes, coach, I don't have to rehab any of my left hamstring. But no, if you want to play, this is what you need to do. So he does it. Before the game, we had one day. Their strength coach calls and he goes, all right, he's good. He's, he's moving around. He looks great. I said, okay, here's the problem. You've, you sped this up so much that he's not going to be able to play next week. 
he'll play this week and he'll play really well. But we sped up that neurology so fast that his body hasn't had a chance to just normally recover from his right. injury. He goes, I don't care. He needs to play against the number one team in the nation for us to win. He can take the next two weeks off. We're playing buttercups. Okay, fair enough. Now, he's, he doesn't believe me. He goes, okay. So he plays. Calls me on Saturday night. They lost by a touchdown, but they played well. This guy had kind of two touchdowns, whatever. He calls me. He's like, you're not going to believe this shit. I go, what? He goes, he hit his fastest speed ever on the GPS. Fastest speed ever. We didn't do any speed training. He hit the fastest speed he's ever hit. It's okay. Call him in the morning. He's like, why? I go, he ain't coming to practice. He couldn't get out of bed. Because he, because he, he we sped it up so fast. Right, he didn't have right. a chance for the normal physiology to occur in the healing. Right. But that's what they wanted. And it worked. Right. So how would that work in a normal world? I would give him the opportunity to recover it normally, but I'm taking away the threat that that injury is there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. It's crazy it it is crazy. I think something like this, people really need to get like, you have to go through it. You know, we got to, yeah, we got to totally dig deeper. What's Dan, what, like, I know you have some articles on simply yep. faster. There's YouTube, you know, people have podcasts with you on YouTube. Uh, you're doing the, what's the next conference you're speaking at? I'm going, me, Cal Dietz and Chris Corfus are speaking in Minnesota on July 15th or 16th, I think, right in the football stadium, their whole place there. Which conference, is it for Minnesota? Yeah, it's, it's Minnesota's football stadium and old complex, but Cal and Chris and I are just coming together and we're just talking about the latest things that we're doing. And so is, where, where do they sign up for it? Right in Minnesota. It's on um, Cal's Twitter. It's on Chris Corfus's Twitter. Um, I'm not really huge on the social media, but yeah. it's on mine too, somewhere. Cool. All right. I'll find it. I'll link it up because that's awesome. like next week. Yeah. It's- yeah, that's actually not this weekend. So the next weekend. So I'll I'll get on that. What else? Awesome. What are other ways people could learn from you? They can email me. I, I love answering questions and talking shop and giving people like go experiment with this. Yeah. Come back and tell me how it is. Because when you experiment with it and you call me and you go, Hey, I did this and this worked even better. I'm like, oh shit, I'm taking notes. Going, okay. Good. I'm gonna test stuff with my right knee yeah. and work the left side. Absolutely. And don't only go back and test it once. If it's better, continue to do another set on the good side. Okay. Well, so what if like my, you know, with my knees, like it's, it's maybe a little bit of like the, the flexion is, and the extension has certainly been haltered through the years through multiple surgeries. Mm -hmm. So um, you've probably had to work with somebody like that. Who's a pro athlete. who have had a lot of surgeries. Yeah. Extension is a problem, right? If for running, because if I can't fully extend, that's yeah, an issue, but, right? But, but but that whole triple extension, when that shit doesn't happen in sprinting, very rarely are you in triple extension. Unless you're track, track and field. Even in track and field, when you look at Usain Bolt, mm-hmm. his leg that's behind <clears> him, <throat> there's a bend in the knee. Hmm. They don't get to triple extension before the process of how they unfold, how they unfold from flexion matters yeah. more than how much extension they're getting. Cause they're all get to their glute, but they don't need complete um, leg extension to get there. Interesting. We had, re- this was really, it was just a fun and like an eye opening conversation. And then kind of like remembering stuff that we used yeah. to do, where you're talking about like wrestling activities or grabbing towels, like just, opening up the repertoire of legitimate performance. Yep. It's really cool. It's like reclaiming athleticism that we have lost through the decades. And what's weird, Dan, is we are the generation that grew up playing in the streets, but we are raising the children to not. We're kind of like, I don't know, we messed it up somewhere. You're not kidding. Like, I, I remember the first conversation I had with my ex-wife, with her three daughters that she had. Mm-hmm. It's the first day of summer vacation. They come down the stairs and they say to her, I, I never forget this. So profound. They go, what are we going to do today? And I looked at my ex-wife and I was waiting for her answer. I'm like, you're going to create the entertainment for them? No, yeah. no, no. 
they're going to open the door and go outside and find <laughs> something to do. Yes. Run around. You're athletes. Go do something. Like my son the other day said, Dad, what are we doing today? I go, I don't know what the hell you're doing, but you better go get a ball or something and go get the friends on your street and start playing. Everything is too, they're used to being coached and organized. So it, yep. it takes away the creativity. Yep. And what, we don't have a yeah. video game in this house. I don't own one video game. Nice. Not in what, this house. You're in uh, Rochester, right? So Rochester, are you near New mountains, York. lakes, all that? No, we just got oh. a big backyard and <laughs> to just run around and play, figure it out. Yeah. I'm in a little beach town. So oh, it's nice. like, oh, yeah. My, uh, Sun will be, you know, they'll be at the beach all day. Football, half in the water, surfing. half out on the sand. Me, yeah. the tactile stimulation for the feet, all that. That's awesome. It is awesome. And that's why I think this little town has great athletes. You don't see them like, got to go get a strength coach, but they're, you still have a lot of multiple multi sport athletes in this small town because you, yep. you have to. You don't yep. have enough kids to fill a team. So it's that's pretty awesome. cool. Yeah. That is awesome. That it is, is great. cool. A um, lot of coaches mm -hmm. give it a lot of lip service if I want their kids to play other sports. I want my kids competing all the time. I don't care what it is. We got a tight end right now that's a fantastic basketball player. Nice. And I can't wait to watch a little cornerback try to tackle him when I throw him the ball because he's got soft hands. He can catch it. Right. He can run. It's awesome. Awesome. Great. Yeah. This was awesome, dude. This was great. So email. Um, for people uh, listening, you want me to give your email right now, Dan? Yeah, or? you can. Yeah, and, yeah. and my Twitter and Instagram. All yeah. That. So if they if they just Google want to get fast, they should start. They'll start coming across a lot of your stuff. Um, yep. And um, yeah, so we got what well, you have your training facility. Want to get fast? That's also your yep. Twitter handle, I think. WGF one. WGF, WGF. That's right. Want to yep. get fast one, then email is dfictorwgf at gmail.com. But I think if people yep. Google Dan Victor want to get fast, that's the good thing is they'll come up with a ton of stuff to go down the rabbit hole. And Absolutely. Uh, I'm encouraging coaches to do that, like how you went down the rabbit hole, Mel Sif, like reading all these books. Like if you want to be great at coaching, it's interesting you say it. You're like, I don't really think I'm that great. I don't think I'm that smart. That's what I think great coaches feel like. You're always like, I got to get better. You got to. Yeah. Got to. This I just know this. Awesome. We've talked for a little over an hour or two hours, whatever Close it is. Two hours. Somebody's getting better than me because I'm not doing anything right Dang now. So I got to figure out. <laughs> All right, dude. You're the best. Uh, for everybody listening, big thanks. Make sure you connect with Dan. Um, reach out and find out how to get to that seminar in uh, Minnesota if you're somewhere in that area. And Dan, hang tight uh, for everybody listening. Big thanks. Please share. If you're on YouTube, you guys know what to do. We need the support to help spread the word for this kind of information. You know, Matt Wenning says um, it's not like entertaining, but we need this education to get to the forefront. So it requires likes, comments, sharing, and all that stuff. So Dan, hang tight, my brother. And again, thanks you to everybody it. for listening.